has been a great day. I'm sorry I missed the morning, but uh, it's just been a great conversation so far. And I have this great honor to be able to kind of frame this next panel um, for uh, university presidents who are really breaking the mold. They're at the vanguard of higher education. I'm very eager to hear from them. We had an interesting conversation earlier today, and they have a lot of uh, amazing insights to share. But I thought I'd just sort of um, frame this conversation in, in the broadest uh, way partly by um, starting with my own experience. <laughs> so I graduated from Troy High School, which is in Fullerton, California, a long time ago. Um, I don't want to tell you how long ago, because you'll do the math, because you're fast at that. But l let me just say that um, this song was actually number one <laughs> on the hits. Do you remember it? You're probably the same age as me then. We used to call them billboards then. So in my career, I think, was very common for my generation, and I suspect <laughs> looking around perhaps for some of you as well. So I graduated from high school, planning to be a French lit major, and uh, you know, I went to college, abandoned that idea really quickly. Instead, I became a government major. After graduating from college, I went on to graduate school in public policy, and then I proceeded to work in government for the next three decades. I, worked, I had the great pleasure of working on the Hill, at the White House, at the Office of Manage Management and Budget, which is sort of my institutional home. And now I'm at the Hewlett Foundation. So I've really been kind of blessed, I think, in what I've been able to do, which is to say I ended up working in the same field as my academic domain. I've changed jobs, but they've all been within the same broad area or field. So what about uh, others? It's my son, Lucas. Uh, he graduated from high school in 2008, it was at the start of the Great Recession. And uh, he also went on to college. He ended up with a computer science degree. He's now gainfully employed. I'm very excited about that. He's not off our cell phone plan yet, though that's the next, the next <laughs> <laughs> sort of goal. But you know, for many in his generation, and you know these figures well, the situation's been much more difficult. And you've seen all the same figures. Um, this was a few years ago, but in 2012, an AP report showing that 53% of um, college students are either unemployed or underemployed. That may have changed a little bit in the past few years, but the bottom line is still something like that. And also, unlike uh, our generation or my generation, students born today will have 10 to 14 different jobs by the time they're 38. And further complicating things, According to the Department of Labor, most of those jobs have not yet been invented. So my um, Lucas's friends have, have job titles like Code Wrangler, um, Happiness Engineer. They have very different kinds of jobs than we had. But none of those reports are actually terribly surprising if you look at the labor market fundamentals. Some of you may have seen this before, but what it was was a really interesting um, analysis that uh, Frank Levy from MIT and Richard Renane from Harvard did actually a while ago where they went back 40 years and looked at the job skill demand. They sort of said, what's happened to it over time? And I think what you can sort of, what you can see is that these uh, sort of new skills, working with new information, solving unstructured problems, things that technology cannot replicate. Technology is very good at following rules and ingesting lots of data being very patient and doing a lot of things actually that people have been able to do. It's not so good yet at uh, sort of the, some of these manual tasks. What was really interesting, it's a little maybe hard to see this in the colors, but the um, sort of manual tasks have actually kind of, they went down, they kind of bottomed out. What's been um, striking to me is there's a line, it's green, it's a little, maybe a little hard to see, called routine cognitive tasks. Those are tasks like, um, tax accountants. They're, they're the kinds of things that technology can and has replaced. Those are falling the furthest, fastest. Those are also the, the sort of skills, I think, that have fueled the middle class for a very long time and are part of the reason we have this huge equity divide that we're now facing. So and, and in addition to a sort of a much more challenging labor market, Lucas and his generation is entering a world of unprecedented environmental and social change. He'll sort of witness, I think, catastrophic changes, and he and his generation will need to make some very un unbearable choices. 
So what do we do? Like that polar bear, you know, clinging to the iceberg, I think we all feel the same thing, which is that we are sort of running out of time. And this is a challenge um, that you and higher ed, I think, are seeing kind of big time. But I guess I would contend that it's not yours alone to solve. I think K-12 has a huge responsibility to present you students who are entering in their freshman year with the analytic skills that they will need and sort of um, to be successful in college, career, and citizenship. So what are some of those skills? We've actually taken a look at this and uh, asked a lot of people, and these are the things that the research returned. Um, students will need to, this is a familiar list, think critically and solve complex problems. They'll need to communicate effectively, written, oral, listening skills. They'll need to work collaboratively, work in teams, because that's the workforce of the future. They'll need to learn how to learn. You've already heard a lot about that today, because they'll have many jobs in their lifetime. And they'll need to sort of develop an academic mindset, that they belong in, a, in an academic community, that learning pays off. And they'll need to, need to do that through mastery of academic content. These are not separate skills outside of the disciplines, we believe. We've called this deeper learning. So how do we spread deeper learning widely to all students? That's sort of the next question. I think the good news, uh, some of you may have heard about this, is that there are a new set of common ac academic standards called the Common Core Standards. Is anyone that registered yeah, with folks? Yes? That's good. It's actually in most states, although one state just withdrew yesterday. Um, these are much more kind of rigorous standards. They're uh, focused, for example, in math on, on coherence across uh, concepts. They try to get um, into the qu most important concepts and, and try to um, uh, really focus what the curriculum looks like. They, are much, they demand a lot more analytic reasoning of students. And teachers like them, which is great news, I think. And I think even more exciting are the kind of new assessments that will accompany them. So I'm a big uh, fan of this phrase, tell me how you'll measure me and I'll tell you how, how I behave. In the K-12 system, they, the way that the K-12 system measures itself, rewards itself, punishes itself, is through state standardized tests. The state standardized tests have gotten um, pretty low level over the last 10 years. They're cheap, they're mostly bubble tests, and uh, the new Common Core assessments are gonna be, I think, a lot better. They'll actually demand uh, more writing, they'll be online, they're a lot more sophisticated. We've done some serious analysis of these new assessments, and we have reason to, to be optimistic. So I, I think my main message to you is that the system drivers, I think of it, the standards and assessments are in place all of this will take a while to play out. It's not gonna happen immediately. You're not gonna get freshmen next year that are gonna be markedly different. But I think, I, have, I am optimistic about where we are in the K-12 system, and I hope you will share that. And sort of, I guess, my message to higher ed is, you know, there is a, a change underfoot, um, and help is on the way. So my, but sort of, my parting shot, I guess, for, for higher ed are, are a few things, and the business community. One is to, the Common Core standards right now are under some political attack. There is a great role, I think, for higher ed to begin to play in understanding what they are, in validating, what, if, you, if you believe that, what the standards say, and also getting involved with some of the assessments. I think the kind of key thing is for higher ed to provide clarity to K-12 about what they should be shooting for, and for the workforce to do the same thing for you all. I think second to sort of, you've talked a lot about this today, reducing the friction students experience as they make that transition from college to career by creating greater opportunities to, con to connect to real world opportunities, and you'll hear a lot more about that in a moment. And I guess last, it's really to begin to focus on those skills that matter most for students later in life and to begin to measure your own success on that basis in addition to the academic scholarship that's so important for higher ed. So may, maybe this is the last, uh, last thought to leave you with. It's an old quote that you probably have seen before, which is to say it's not the strongest species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It's the one that is most adaptable to change, Charles Darwin. So 
Um, let's see, I think I'm turning this over to Catherine then. Yep. Oh, to. Thank you.